Our other two people are on the way. Uh, but I think they were over at the voice actor panel, but they'll be here shortly. We'll, we'll fill them in. They already... It's counting up. They know the spiel, so... I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, welcome. We are Equestria Daily pre-readers. Uh, I am Ben Mann. I'm Pegasus Rescue Brigade. And I'm Alex Straza. Uh, so we are responsible for uh, the fan fiction that gets posted on Equestria Daily. Uh, so we're, we're going to be going over a quick rundown of how the process works, and then most of this is going to be opening it up to questions uh, about the, the details of what we do, how we make our decisions about fan fiction in general, because all of us are writers as well as pre-readers. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that some of us are not terrible. Uh, <laughs> Which one? Uh, oh. It is not me. I mean, I don't dislike we, Sky Pirates. Are we, are we allowed to say who that is or not? Yeah, I, I think we should respect the pseudonymity, I, whatever the word is. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, yeah that, he does, there is a guy who uses that pseudonym, and I should probably mm -hmm. not tell you the other names he goes by, because yeah, he'd when, be using them if he wanted people to know. Typically, when we write a response that we send out to an author who has uh, submitted their story, we sign it with something different than our actual author name on Fim Fiction. Uh, just because, you know, we don't really want people coming specifically to us to ask additional questions. If you have additional questions, you can just send them to uh, the Equestria Daily Fan Fiction address and we answer them through that. So we try to keep a degree of anonymity in our actual reviews. Yes. <clears throat> And, well, it, it depends on the person. I mean, me personally, I just sign it with Pre-Reader Alex. Other people will do their full names. Other people have, like, five or six that they sign with. That's kind of ridiculous. But, yeah, it depends on the person. Yep. So to go into the general process for how it works, uh, we only go, we, we look at only stories that people submit to us. We do not comb through looking for things to put in the way some of the other aggregators do. Uh, so only if the author submits, that is how the process starts. And then we have like a real quick, someone will take a very fast look at it to comb for just real obvious, yeah, just like yeah. horrible, horrible, unreadable grammar or subject matter that is way mm -hmm. over the line. Like if, if you could like, if someone who can, if you can know in two minutes that it's definitely, definitely not going up, we have that. That's the first pass, basically. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we will send a basically a form letter rejection out, uh, letting the person know that certain aspects of the story definitely need work before we even submit it for careful revision by the pre-readers. And we don't. Uh, oh, here they come. Oh, look who it is. <laughs> you guys get to share the mic. Couch and Aqua. Fashionably late as usual. <laughs> We're just like hobnobbing with the VAs upstairs, no big. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, very good. This is uh, Couch Crusader and Aquaman, part of our. Howdy. We're slightly buzzed. <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> So, if the, most stories do make it past that initial screening for blatant, blatant problems, at which point they get forwarded to the, the big pre-reader mailing list. Uh, so it goes in a spreadsheet with all of the basic information. Uh, and then we come through it as we see ones that we feel like uh, reading. We will pick a story and start reading it. And we get to select the ones we want so that if there is a guy who just hates all like shipping stories, then he can just not read shipping stories, which I think works out mm -hmm. pretty well. Uh, and it's, so we, we choose which ones we're taking on. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why it's useful, another reason that there's a bunch of us, because we all have different tastes, so we all really can f read things that we at least hope we're gonna like. Uh, so we don't have to, you know, have that additional bias already stacked before we get into any reviewing. 
I believe that we have something on like 29 or 30 different pre-readers right now. So like chances are that you're going to get someone who's going to look at your story in the most favorable light possible. Like, well, And the thing I want to add to that is that when we say like one person's looking at it, that doesn't mean that one person exclusively is looking at it. We have a lot of situations where we'll have kind of a group discussion over a particular story, mm -hmm. especially Second if it's opinions. something that's difficult to figure out or kind of like dips into a couple different genres. So it's not out of the question that like we'll have you know our own little you know come to Jesus meeting about it or come to Celestia as the case may be, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to emphasize that, like what they're saying is all that um, we just try to get the right people reading the right stories. Yep. And, sure. Yep. And at that point, we read it and make the uh, and we uh, make the decision about whether it meets the standards that we're trying to have for Equestria Daily. And if it is, then hooray. And if it isn't, then we will... Uh, the rejections vary in length. Uh, some are just a real quick, like a paragraph of, these are the issues that I noticed. And some, some of us like to go very, very in depth, line by line. Uh, so it's, uh, so like our response, so we will give you, some kind of idea. It is general, like it is the responsibility for fixing it up is generally on the author to find uh, if they need more detail than is provided to either ask us for clarification, which happens a lot and like is totally fine, mm -hmm. or to go to uh, another source of. There's a lot of really good communities that will help authors who are having trouble figuring out. They're talking about like dialogue punctuation, what is up with that, or like pacing, how do I figure out what's going on there? Uh, and some of us also like to give a lot of that information on our own time just as they're doing that, which may or may not be changing, but. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so we have, generally speaking, we have a three strike rule. You, so you can fix it and resubmit it, and a lot of really good stories get sent back the first time and then come back even stronger the second or the third time and go up then. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's a useful process for taking some things that are good and making them better. And this is something that's probably going to get me in trouble with like all the other pre-readers when I say this, but um, the three strikes rule is like by no means something like hard and fast that we adhere to 100% of the time. It was, the rule was originally implemented in order to prevent people from just receiving their rejection notice and then just like sending it back an hour later with like minimal fixes on the issues that we told them about and all that. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the times if it's, been, if it's clear that like on the third strike an author has still put in a lot of effort into improving their writing, then we'll more often than not give them like enough, more chances to just like kind of get onto the blog. And we also like have, um, like the levels of rejection like vary, like if we give you a strike it's a moon, but if it's something that we can just like send back for like minor grammar fixes, like a missing word there, then we just send it to Mars instead. <laughs> Which means that when it comes I, back, we're not gonna look over it very carefully, we're just gonna be like, yeah, like you, you did that thing we said, go up. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't have the budget to literally send stories to the moon. Yeah, That's yes. a bit complicated, but, we, but our spreadsheet, we're trying. Our spreadsheet actually does have is coded by celestial body names mm -hmm. to determine where we file away various fanfics. If stuff goes to Mars, if it's for a minor rejection, Moon, if it's for a standard rejection, and the Sun, if it has three strikes or breaks one of our content rules. You don't want to go to the Sun. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's mm. Yeah, so I think that is, is there anything I'm missing in the process of how any obvious stuff <coughs> I don't think so. That seems about right. All right. So, why is it Sun, Moon, and Mars? Why Mars? Um, um, because, because people don't realize that Mars was farther away than this moon. I don't know how it happened. Yeah. We're writers, not astrophysicists. Yeah. So it's oh. <laughs> well, it started with just uh, Sathisto started just yeah. saying to the moon when we rejected something, <laughs> and then as our process started getting more complicated, we also started adding the kind of half rejection, send back for fixes, but not really rejecting it. And the moon was already taken, so then he's like Mars, and we're like, okay. <laughs> One, once we had a um, yeah. to the black hole in the center of the galaxy. <laughs> 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 Seth, is, Seth, Seth is no longer directly involved with our process other than we send him the fanfic and say, this is good to go, post it on the blog. 
but uh, he, there are still relics of his influence in our system. <laughs> his, his legacy lives on. I'm pretty sure that we just like parked a story around Jupiter and just kind of forgot about it. <laughs> so if the fan fiction breaks content rules and you send it to Mars, is that it? Like, say you're like, oh, this is way too violent uh, to, sorry, to the sun. Can I like feel that if I've come down the violence? It, it depends on how severe it is. Sometimes if it's just a scene or two that breaks it, we can say, all right, this is rejected, but if you tone this down, we can look at it again and yeah. reconsider it. Yeah, the conception of um, like when we send stories to Mars, technically, what that signifies for us is that it's a story that, okay, there's like one or two things that are holding it back. If you change these, it's good to go and you're ready to go. So if it is something like, if, I think if we would Mars a story for content if it was like one scene that you could then edit in your mm -hmm. we work in some way so it's a little bit better or just it works yeah, better for what kind of content we're looking for. Yeah. Oh, you're talking yeah, about the sun. Reject. I would say it like is, if you're changing it then like send we, them we usually if you're changing case it, yeah, case, it, it, like the sun is in its current form so if you are in fact changing it and you're reworking it then mm -hmm. that kind of makes it null and void. Yeah, we usually a include a note. We usually include a note in the sun rejections that says this may be available for pre-reading again if it undergoes a significant overhaul but that usually requires a you know base thematic change of the entire story in the cases where we send stuff immediately to the sun anyway. So, so a would, lot of people don't bother. Yeah, I would suggest writing and asking about the particular case because it depends on the story and how much it's being changed, really. If it gets brought within what our guidelines are, then you're good. It won the back Octavia. <laughs> I can only recall one or two situations where the cover art was off and we asked it and we requested it to be changed. But normally if anything like that happens, it's usually, it's usually Seth who does it because he's out of our control. Yeah, we don't edit the, the actual blog. So Seth would, if, you're try, if you want to have it changed, then the way to do it is to write an email to Seth. Oh, I did get it changed. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we do not pay a whole lot of attention to the cover art usually, unless it's like porn or something. I think that's happened once. Yeah. I actually had a follow-up question for this. We have a mic. Ooh. Yeah, it's real now. I have a bit of a follow-up question to his actually, because I submitted a fiction about two years ago before you guys had this this new system of rating. Um, and it, it did not quite make it through, but it got, the last, it got the last strike because it had like a ton, apparently a ton of grammatical issues that my editor missed, and the guy basically described it as death by a thousand needles, more or less. Um, <laughs> following off his question, have you guys ever considered, um, for those fictions that didn't quite make it through, but they could have if they weren't quite that off, have you guys considered like making any kind of like a grace period of like maybe like a year or two and then it could be resubmitted even if it is on the three strike list if the person tries real hard to fix it? I mean like yeah, as, as I said earlier, like the three strikes rule is more of a guideline if you will. Um, like, Do you need a Barbosa hat now? They're really, more guide, they're really more guidelines than actual rules. Yeah, see he's actually the voice actor here, but I mean like, I, Again, like, we don't want submissions coming back like an hour after we reject them with just like one or two fixes instead of just like a thousand and all that. I mean, if it's been a while since like you've received your third strike and you've put a lot of effort into submitting your story, feel free to submit it again. Just like let us know that, hey, it was like, it was like sun back in like so and so, but I worked really hard at it. And like more often than not, like it's very rare that we send a story like that away. Right. Because my submission was, my, would you prefer me to use the mic? Um, my submission was about a year and a half ago. I haven't reopened it since, but I did not realize you guys have this change because last time it was rejected, it was more or less like last nail in the coffin, don't email this again kind mm -hmm. of deal. Yeah. Un unlike un actually firing a story into the literal sun, it's possible to come back from that. So it's not, a, it's not technically a permanent rejection. It's, a, it's basically a permanent rejection on the story's current form. So if the story yes. changes its form significantly, or if really it's just been long enough in some cases, then you can start the process over and 
we'll basically treat it like a clean slate depending on how much is put into it. Like, if it's had significant changes undergone, it's basically a clean slate. Yeah, a similar situ situation actually happened really recently. We got a fic back that was, I think, 10 <coughs> months ago it was sunned, and you know, we took another look at it. Uh, you and, did you have a question in the back with the Luna shirt? Is it? I, I can't see. <laughs> so that's a quick question. Um, since you guys probably get like millions and millions of figs in your mailbox every day, and I'm sure you guys have busy schedules, like how do you find time to read through it and then like judge it? Because like for example, if you get like a chapter story that's hard to decide or if it's like 20 pages, you have to go through all that and that takes a while. So how do you find the time to read it and judge it? We get new pre-readers and we make them do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's why there are a lot of us. We, we split up the work between everybody. And even so, it, it sometimes takes us quite a while to get a response back to an author. But um, when, when you send in a submission, it initially goes to the uh, Equestria Daily fan fiction address. And then from there is forwarded individually to all the pre-readers. And then we have a spreadsheet that we all have access to. So we can choose and mark, I'm, I'm going to pre-read this one. So then everybody knows which ones are taken and which ones are not. And we can more efficiently divide up the work. Yeah, And also, like, we don't necessarily read every word of every story. Like, if someone submits something that is 200,000 words long, and I can tell after 3,000 that this is going to be a rejection, I am not reading 200,000 words of that story. I'll probably read, like, five or six so that I can give something useful when I write and say why it's being rejected. The thing is, like, when you submit to Equestria Daily, you're basically throwing your story into a slush pile, just like any other publishing house out, out there. And um, I'm going to speak for myself here, at the very least. Like, I'm looking for reasons to, like, send your story away, like, right away, just because, like, we have this enormous volume of stories to deal with. Like, getting, getting published on Equestria Daily should be treated as a privilege, I think. And so, like, we really do expect you to, like, put your best foot forward and, like, really show us, like, what you can do with the written word. And I want to emphasize, like, the reason, when he says that word, looking for reasons to reject a story. That doesn't mean like we're actively going out and we're trying to antagonize authors. What it means is that just by virtue of the sheer number of stories we get submitted to us, we have to hold ourselves and the stuff that we put, that we end up posting to a pretty high standard. So like, I'm looking for every, I would love to see every story go up. The problem mm -hmm. is there are a lot of them that can't for various reasons. So I'm looking for reasons to reject it because I'm trying, uh, giving it a trial by fire. So if it passes the trial by fire, then it can go up, and I'm happy to send it up. And if it doesn't, I'm going to tell you, right, here's where you fell off, here's what didn't work out as well. Come back again, give it another go, and we'll see how it works then. We receive between 8 and 12 submissions every day, so if we put every single one of those up, you wouldn't be able to find the rest of the content on EQD under all of the fanfics. Um, I was wondering if I've had a, I've submitted to EQD about four times thus far, and three out of those four times, uh, the pre-reader who's read it has sent it back to me with the rejection notice of basically a big fu, right? Like the story sucks. You should go, you know, die, jump off a cliff, or something. Do you get the get complaints about that a lot, or and do you take like corrective measures if that happens too often? Uh, I have occasionally we get people uh, we, we get people mentioning uh, the specific we get people talking about how the rejection letter came off as insulting. Uh, when we hear about that, we do look into it, and the and we can all see the rejection letters that everybody sends out. Like it is there's a it's like done through an email list with a reply all button. So we can so when we hear that, we can just easily go into the thread and look at the email. And we do, when we hear that, we do take it seriously and we do look them over and we will come to a judgment about whether or not it was out of line. If we do feel it was out of line, then uh, we will talk to the pre-reader who wrote it. And if you have not already, uh, I would suggest writing just a email to the submit at Equestria Daily saying, these are the things that were said to me and I thought it was out of line because X, Y, Z, if you haven't already done something like that. Do you want that? to send it to the submit box or to the fan fiction box? Uh, I don't know. You, the, you probably want to send it as a reply to, to whatever yeah. the story box. was. Right, yes, because submit is sophisticated. And, and, 
and he doesn't see that. Right? The, the biggest thing we're trying to work on, like, and this is something that I'll admit freely that we've had some issues with in the past and something that we're still working on trying to improve, is it's not even necessarily that we're trying, again, that we're trying to antagonize people. It's just like sometimes the way we communicate that we think is okay is it ends up pissing people off. And that's not something we want for a variety of reasons. So like when somebody complains, says like, I feel like this review I got was rude. And it, as you've described, it told me to jump off a cliff and die. I mean, regardless of what we meant by it and regardless of how we thought it was, it doesn't really matter because we're the people communicating with you and we need to maintain a professional demeanor at all times. So any comment like that is taken seriously because any comment like that indicates somewhere where we failed on that front. And so we need to fix that. I do want, I do want to say, however, that like, um, this kind of communication is a two-way street. Um, like there, there will be times when the pre when like the pre-reader response will just like kind of tear you up on the inside. But like, it really reflects well on you if you're able to reply to that response in a rational, cogent manner and not just like fly off the handle, rage and all that thing. Because there's nothing that invites a pre-reader's attention more than just someone who's flying off the handle in one of their reply emails mm -hmm. or in a public blog post. Oh yeah, yeah. Be, be, because because like we do, I mean, I mean, it may not be through official channels, but we often do like follow up on how our rejection notices are handled by the authors we're sending away and all that, and like we do find them, like we do find those angry blog posts, that kind of thing. We're watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those reviews that we send are not. If we send you a long list of corrections, that's not meant to be an insult to you. You know, it's us trying to help, but a lot of people will take it even even sometimes when the review isn't uh, particularly insulting. People will just be upset, and it's it's you have to try to understand that we're trying to help by providing that information so that you can get posted later. Yeah, and it is hard. Like as a guy who has received like rejections from Equestria <laughs> Daily saying this in, this whole story is just really boring, and then tells you exactly why it is boring. Like this has happened to things I have submit and. It hurts, but it was also really helpful. Like, and it was, it, it was, at least in this particular case, it was true. And I am really grateful for the guy who was telling me that. But it is not an easy thing to do to walk the line, that line. And sometimes we veer off too far in one direction, and we want to hear about it when we do. Hello. Hey, Whoa. Um, if you guys have already answered this question, uh, I'm sorry I got a little bit late. Uh, my pen name is Cyborg Samurai, and I've had uh, two stories approved and posted on EQD. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, the uh, reply email chain was posted on both the stories, and uh, it said that it was like Mars or something like that because one of them had uh, some corrections to make before it was posted. Um, so obviously that's some kind of approval system you guys have. I was just wondering what the specifics were of that. Yeah, we did talk about that earlier. Yeah, and also that probably wasn't supposed to come to you. <laughs> Usually the, uh, the code words that we use for our, um, which type of rejection we're using are, are meant to be within the pre-reader chain. But now and then, since everything goes through the, the fan fiction address, sometimes the entire uh, thread is accidentally copied and sent to the author. But uh, indirect answer to your question, though, the phrase Mars is our little internal dialogue for a story that's basically ready to be posted, but there are a couple things holding it back that usually could be fairly quickly fixed, or even if it can't be quickly fixed, it's like, all right, this is the single thing that's keeping me from saying go for it. Um, the other terms in that little, you know, lexicon there, I think is a moon. We send it to the moon if it's just a standard rejection. Um, into the sun if it's it's third strike or some usually just content is what gets that where it's just clearly not ever going to be posted mm -hmm. um, post is post obviously a couple stories we've sent to black holes in the center of the galaxy that's not fun for anyone involved <laughs> so I mean like you I, like you probably shouldn't have gotten that particular email in your reply chain and all that but like seeing the word Mars in there like that's a really good sign yeah, you're 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 coming you're, back and like you're, you're yeah you're most likely heading on the blog very very soon. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> now you do. All right. Uh, um, I had a friend post a EQD once, mm -hmm. 
he came back with a letter with just a few typos and stuff like that, the pre-order said. He submitted it a second time and he got a whole uh, opinionated uh, response from a different pre-reader. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how would that work for him? Do you, Are you like, referring to like what he should do to get it posted? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, and that, what you've kind of touched on there is something that, it's another problem that we're trying to work on is a lack of consistency among different pre-readers. Because different pre-readers do have different styles of review and they do have different depths to which they'll go into detail about what's wrong with the story. So like there are guys that sometimes just do bullet pointed lists of like here's a gen like a general list of stuff that's wrong with it. And then there'll be guys that will go line by line and I mean kind of tear it a new one in what they hope is a nice and you know friendly way. Uh, but as far as him getting it on the blog goes, the different responses represent two different people's views of what the story's like. So the best advice I can give him is to try to take both of them into account if he's unclear about it, especially because it seems like he's received two rejections so far. Okay, so the next one would be his third one, and that would end up being the last one he'd have under the current system. So especially since it's going to be his third strike next time or his third try, um, if he really wants to fix it, tell him to email us back and ask for some real specific clarification on anything he's unclear about. I can't really guarantee at this point, and this is because we're still in the process of trying to fix this, I can't guarantee that you know, he's not going to get another guy. We try to keep the same pre-readers reading the same stories when they get resubmitted, but sometimes it works out that a different mm -hmm. guy will have to take it on. And not only just like um, sending things like back to us as well, but just really trying to go out there, digging into Fin Fiction, Pony Chan, um, Reddit. Like, all, like there are a million support groups out there about people who just want, who just want to like take stories and just like spruce them up to like the best they could possibly be there. I mean, like since it is like your friend's third strike, like I think it really behooves him that he should really yeah. do <laughs> yeah, I mean, like he, he he should he should do like everything in his power to make that story as good, as as like polished as it can possibly be when it comes back to us for the final time. Yeah, and to build on what Couch was just saying, uh, when you get a rejection, unless we specifically say like just fix this one thing and then you're good, don't assume it's a comprehensive list. This is a thing that I f we were having some trouble communicating, and I feel we've got better about specifying li li lately, but. This is not like, unless we specifically say, just do this and you'll be on the blog, it does not mean just fix these things and be on the blog. It means these are the most immediate problem, like these are problems that I saw. And if they're not fixed, then it won't go up. But this is not meant to be a comprehensive reading like, w like of everything that's off with your story. This is, this is sufficient for me to know it's not going up on the blog. Yeah. And, it is a good idea to use all of the resources that Couch was talking about and put in the time and make it as good as it can possibly be before you send it back again. I mean, as PRB said earlier, we get like eight to 12 submissions a day. And then as Ben was talking about earlier, if we get like a 200,000 word story, we're only gonna be able to really to rationally have time to read like five or 6,000 words of it. So that's what I wanna emphasize as far as it not being a comprehensive list. Due to time constraints or just like the sheer length of your story, it's entirely possible that we were not able to read the entire thing. So treat any rejection that has details like that as kind of an overview of what may or may not be wrong with it. And then you like make as many corrections as you can about that. And then also, as Couch was talking about, pursue other uh, opportunities, pursue other venues where you can get a little bit more specific criticism. So yeah, I have the mic. Get the mic to you what, what do you, do you ever take like, so for like film fiction, there's obviously a bunch of readers for the stories. Do you ever take their opinion into account? So like I got a rejection, I've been, I've been posted on the blog once, um, but I got a rejection for one of my stories saying it was unfunny, but I have 2,100 people telling me the exact opposite of Thank that. You. So. Did you ever take that into account? It's like, wait a minute, people love this story and they think it's hilarious. I don't. What do you go for there? Do you want an honest answer? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I wouldn't have asked if I didn't want an honest answer. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things that, and I don't mean that to compare this to you at all, I'm just using this in a, as an example. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey has sold 70 million copies. <laughs> Again, this does yeah. not necessarily apply to you, but this is why we can't judge stories and popularity because popularity does not necessarily indicate quality. And what we are looking for is not necessarily 
the pop, most popular stories, the original intent of the blog was to highlight the best of the best. So whatever we can find that meets our standards of you know something that we would feel comfortable with representing the best of what the pony fiction has to offer. And on the specific note of your story, when you're talking about you were told that it wasn't funny and you have 2,100 people saying otherwise, I mean, it is one person's opinion um, determining whether you're going to blog. And there's, stu there's a part of that that's inherently subjective, and there's a part of that that can't really be changed. But um, I would encourage you that if you feel like it's one person thinking it's not funny, it is within your right as a submitting author to ask for a different pre-reader to read it. So with your story in particular, if the one pre-reader who got it looked at it and said, I don't think this is funny, I don't want it going up, you can look at, um, you can ask for a different pre-reader to read it. The second guy might read and go, hey, I think this is hilarious, we should throw it up. Because um, pre-readers disagree has, about different things. I mean, like, Alex likes past sins, and, you know, we try to tolerate that as much as we can. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> I should read that. And Nines likes, Nines likes what? That through the eyes of another I, I, I think we don't need to be highlighting specific things. <laughs> okay. Come on up, sir. <laughs> yeah, I want to say, depending, depending on which pre-reader you get, I want to remind people that you can often ask them for more information with act, without actually submitting a third time. Uh, some pre-readers I know kind of prefer to be more anonymous than others, but you know, it never hurts to ask for more. So if you do get a rejection and you're not clear about the rejection, rather than, you know, using another one of the submits, because even though it's not an ironclad rule, you know, if it is a third submission, it will be noted and it'll just kind of drop down on the queue, so to speak. So don't, you know, don't forget to say, well, what did you mean by this? Or how could I possibly improve this? I, speaking purely for myself, uh, I, I pre-read stuff that I think only has the possibility of um, getting onto the site. And I don't usually assume that I'm that anonymous with it. I say, well, this is you know, what I think you should do, and you know, come back to me for help. And I've had some authors who you know, did not take kindly to that. Uh, oddly enough, the ones that I share a forum with, which you'd think they'd be like, oh, it's you. You, you, know, you can help me out. No, they just get angry. But uh, the point is that you can work with the pre-reader with individually without actually having to uh, resubmit. And I think a lot of people uh, definitely benefit from that because it's a lot more uh, leisurely experience when you know you're dealing with someone who's sympathetic. And most of the pre-readers are sympathetic, you know, uh, to the people writing and submitting. You know, it's not rejecting for fun. It's just kind of... Um, rejecting because that's just kind of editing what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we do this because we really love fan fiction. Like, that's what brings us here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which one of you was Nines? Nines is not here today. Oh, he was going to be on the panel, but he, did, he couldn't make it. <laughs> He's in Iowa. Oh, yeah. It's Chris. Oh, God, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're waiting to meet you guys. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, if you do... If you do um, need specification on some information that you received in your review, just reply to the email that you received the review in and it will go back to the pre-readers and they'll answer the question. He's been waiting for a while. Sorry about this. Um, I, I've submitted two stories to EQD. One got up, one didn't. And the one that didn't, the email that came back said that there was discussion about whether or not it should go up and it, it decided it was uh, wasn't up to standard. Does that happen often? Do you, if somebody's on the fence, do they bring it to the attention of other authors, or is that? We, we always ask for second opinions when there's any uh, doubt about whether or not it belongs on the blog. We can mark that on our spreadsheet, and then it, the email chain quickly turns into a, a discussion between several of us. Yeah, sometimes we get third and fourth and <laughs> tenth opinions. <laughs> And like, um, it's not just in the email chains as well. Like, we have our own super duper special Skype group, and all that. Secret. Yeah, mm -hmm. you won't believe the things that go on in there. But like, really oh. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. I wish I could not believe there sometimes. Yeah, it's 
Yeah, Twilight with googly eyes is like the photo and everything. But um, yeah, serial velocity tends to take every uh, conversation picture and shop googly eyes onto it whenever we change it in the Equestria Daily chat. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's actually cute. Yeah, but like, yeah, like on topic, like um, there are a lot of times in which like the pre-readers will bring a story like into that group because like they're just like a bunch of us on at the same time. We'll just like kind of kick it around and just like try and see what's going on with it. I said I got here late, so I apologize this is already asked, but um, I think on the submission form it says that you guys don't necessarily look at fix in order when they're submitted. <coughs> so is there anything in that you guys look for in the description or the title or the author comments that makes you go, ooh, I want to look at this? If you submit a story about Nicolas Cage, Alex will be on it. <laughs> <laughs> this is 100% true. Like, I like to picture us with like him on a leash, holding him back from getting on the Nicolas Cage stories. Yeah. It's kind Nic of frightening. Nicolas Cage is our mascot. But it, just in general, <laughs> the same things that would make me read just a story for fun will make me read your story if it's in the queue. Like if your story like is not at, at the back of the queue, but I see it and I'm like, oh well, my stars, I have to read the story, then I'm gonna read that story. That is what mm -hmm. makes things, and also if something is towards the back of the queue and it's like a science fiction crossover thing, I personally don't like that. I would not give it a fair shake, so I'm just gonna skip over it and leave it for somebody who can give it the attention it deserves. Essentially what he's trying to say is as much as everyone in here and up here wants to pretend otherwise, we do judge books by their covers. A little bit, we try not to, but if I see a story with a really interesting description, or even if it just does something that I haven't seen done before, that's one I would like to look at more quickly, rather like, <coughs> if it's the thousandth Apple Dash shipic we've gotten in a week, <laughs> which is a lowball estimate, but anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, that's the one that I'm gonna be less likely to look at, not even necessarily because I'm not a huge shipping person, but just because it's the thousandth story I've seen like this in a week. So definitely try to make something, usually in the description or on the conceptual stage, it really helps if you have something that stands out. Uh, what what is with the prejudice against OC on Question Daily? I mean, y'all all seem to be harder on stories that had OCs and stories that had canon characters. I mean, is, is that a personal prejudice or? Are you asking about um, how we view the use of original characters in pony fiction? Yeah, well, well, what I'm asking is that it seems like original characters had a harder time of getting on the block than can canon characters, and I'm, I'm just wondering what the thinking behind that is. So you're asking, um, it seems like there's a bit of a higher standard for original characters getting on than, all right. Well, to some degree that's kind of true, and the reason for that is when you're writing about a canon character, um, a lot of their basic personality traits and a lot of what makes them an intriguing character has already been developed like out of your control with the show. So when you're writing a fan fiction on that, you have more leeway to kind of do whatever you feel is like critical to your story. You don't have to worry about develop them, developing them as a character because we already know who Twilight is. We don't need you to tell us that she's a bookworm and that she gets a little bit stressed out during deadlines. Um, but with an original character, it's all on you to develop them into something that's a unique entity. And I'm not even saying like it's something that, oh my god, I've never seen a character like this before. All it has to be is something that makes sense on a conceptual level where you can understand why they're doing the things they're doing and why they act the way they act. I'm, could you repeat that? Yeah, it has to fit in conceptually, kind of stylistically with the universe. Like the problem we have with, you know, the stereotypical bad OC, you know, it's the red and black alicorn that, you know, has knives for hands and, you know, is farts smell like fresh baked cinnamon buns. Like that doesn't make sense in the context of what we know about the universe for, you know, a variety of reasons. So that's the key to making an OC. It's just if it feels like it can fit within the world you're trying to make, even if it's not necessarily the same canon world that we're used to, then that's the kind of standard we're holding it to and that's what we're looking for. And that's why it's harder for someone to get a story about an OC published because it is harder to write an OC than it is to write about a canon character. And so it's something that takes a little bit higher degree of skill, so something that's not as many people can do. Yeah, they're not inherently bad, but you have to have the 
ability to make them seem like a developed character. If they're too flat, then they're just boring most of the time. So it, it varies. It, it can be done. There are plenty of stories about OCs that are very good. Uh, so my question was, earlier you were mentioning that you get maybe like 12 fix a day. Um, I, I know that you guys have been talking about you know, refactoring your system just to optimize a little bit more, but do you think that the current system of having user-submitted content, do you think this is going to continue to be scalable, or do you foresee some day where you're just going to have to like tear it down and you know, have some sort of completely different approval standard? Uh, I think that what we have is probably, I don't think we're going to need to totally redo like everything from the ground up because like the f it doesn't seem like it's getting that much faster in the sense that we'll probably continue to bring on additional pre-readers. I would be surprised if the system changed enough that we had to do, that we had to completely overhaul it, but I mean if, if we do end up needing to then that's what we'll do. <coughs> but it has been changing and evolving and like our standards have been as the fandom has like grown and there's been and, and a lot of the writers have gotten better like our standards have I feel like risen they're higher now than they were 2 years ago so well, I, mean, I the, expect the standard, the standard 2 years ago was does it have ponies of it and can I read it <laughs> I yeah. mean things have changed a little bit since then because I mean we were lucky to get a fanfic submission in a day and now we're getting a like a consistent yeah. flow in so it is a very different environment so we do have to change things how yeah. we deal with it. And I would expect to continue to evolve as needed, but I do not see any giant changes in standards or, or process in the immediate future, except for likely the ways in which we structure Just our responses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would be my expectation, but that's not a promise. So I just have a couple um, crossover ideas to run by the pre-readers. One of them will be called the Wicker Main. Yes. And how about the Barn with Shining Armor is Tommy Wiseau, Cadence is Lisa, Big Mac is Mark, and Twilight Sparkle as Denny. Yes. That's all I needed. Thank you, guys. I'm Gary Oak, by the way. Are you interested in a job? Gary Oak. <laughs> I'm just curious, what do you think is your number one best story, short what it's about, and why do you think it's your best story? Not something that you've accepted, something that you've written yourself. Oh, oh God, we have to talk about ourselves now. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> oh, I love talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> when I finish a story, I'll let you know. Okay, so, uh, so among the ones I've written, my personal favorite would probably be uh, Mortal is a extended look at <coughs> Uh, so there's a kind of a subgenre of Alicorn Twilight outlives all of her friends, and there are ways in which this is handled that make me really angry. I think it's actually some kind of harmful, and so I tried to do a fic of that style that go that I don't want to get into the specifics, but it that explores the ways of dealing with death that I think in what I think is a healthier way. The name is Mortal, as my favorite of the ones that I've written. Me? Um, my, my favorite of mine is probably not my most popular. Everybody knows me for a fanfic called Shipping and Handling. Woo. That was about, um, yeah. <laughs> that was about, um, well, I called her Ditsy Do at the time, but Derpy Hooves, uh, winding up at a matchmaking company after she loses her job at the, uh, Mail company, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, but um, I'm. I think my my best completed one to me is probably Fluttershy's Bad Hair Day, in which Fluttershy turns into a rabbit, and hair in the title is H A R E. Um, or the <laughs> or the sequel to Shipping Handling is in progress right now, and I feel like that is turning out better than the first one, but it's very different, so it's it's not for exactly the same audience. But that's called Hocus Pocus, if you want to look that up. <laughs> I think out of the fix I've written, my favorite would be The Rise of Iron Mare, simply because A, 
I can visibly see the difference in writing between that and my first fic, the 63rd rune. And B, it's my most popular thing by far. And that's a good indicator to me. <laughs> well, um, I, I wrote a story like back in November 2011 called Wing Mares. Um, it's between, no one's heard of it, but like, uh, it's, it's between like how I think Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash like met each other at summer camp. And it leads up to like the story that Rainbow Dash tells in Cutie Mark Chronicles. Uh, it took me about a month to do that and like, I, I'm still not sure like how I was able to just like get out a story that fast. Right now, I'm working on a My Little Pony Pacific Rim crossover, and these guys won't tell me that it's a bad idea. <laughs> we won't tell you it's a bad idea because it's an amazing idea. <laughs> well, I'm calling it Ponyville Rim for now. That's a working title. Okay. Um, well, when I get out of my normal degree of self-loathing for everything I've ever touched, um, <laughs> The, my most, I think the most recent thing I actually finished was something called Sky Pirates of Equestria, which was, it was me, it was like th two or three years ago, we had a story that was not related to pirates at all, but something in the title, I think, reminded yeah. you of pirates. So we had this so, giant... Yeah. So, we, so, we had this, so we had this email come in, and the story was called Rarity, but it had like a backwards R as in Russian, and you pronounce that letter as Ya. And I remember like Pineapple Skater just like comes in and she's just like Rarity the Pirate Queen and just snowballed from there. Yeah, so that <laughs> oh, happened boy, like a year and a half ago and we all thought we were going to do this big thing where like everybody in the group would write an entry in this Pirates anthology and it was going to be awesome and it never happened. But a year and a half later, the idea for one I wanted to do was still in my head. So I ended up taking it, making the ships like magically enchanted flying ships, making the whole thing this huge like wink wink reference to Pirates of the Caribbean and... I thought it was really fun. No one read it, but I liked it. <laughs> and the, the story that I'm actually proud of, though, is the one that I've just now started re writing again after like seven months of pretending it didn't exist, was a story called Harmony, which, thank you for that. Um, I feel loved. But it is a crossover. It's actually, I call it an adaptation of Bioshock for the world of MLP because it's not a crossover as much as it was me doing what I can only describe as a fall at Equestria level, like way too thorough and way too in-depth, complete conversion of Bioshock into something that would work in the world of MLP. And I, I can't speak objectively whether I actually did, but it's, it was fun as hell to just outline. It's still fun to write, so I'm gonna keep working on it. I'll see what happens. Maybe I'll finish it someday. Hope to God. We're not about bribery. <laughs> uh, reviews, like we get a lot of uh, people who submit on the strength of their stories, which is like, this is a good first step, but what we really want to see is like, if you have reviewed stories and said whether you like it and whether you don't and why, like that is, mm -hmm. if you uh, ask to join and you don't have something like that to show us, we will ask you to like, we will ask you to do that. The critical thing is not being able to say, I don't like the story. The critical thing is being able to explain why. Like, and mm -hmm. be able to enunciate and to like elaborate upon the things that don't work in the story and like the structural components of it that are making it not work. So I mean, like anybody can look at a movie and, or a story or anything artistic and say, I don't like it, I could be a critic. I mean, I'm not gonna say being a critic is intense and like intensely hard and it doesn't compare to being an artist. But there is something you, you need to be able to at least explain your opinion and justify it. It's basically uh, like being in a debate, only you're writing it down and we're talking about Technicolor horses. Mm -hmm. And there are opportunities out there to, uh, pe you know, people are searching for editors. So if you do the review of that story and uh, it's good and you show us an example of that review, it's, it's like applying for any other job. You have to, you know, give us a reason to believe that you know how to do the job we do before we consider uh, hiring you. Or not really hiring, none of us get paid. <laughs> yeah, but if it, and, I'll, and also I'll say, like, if you are able to do this and do it well, and this sounds like a thing you'd want to do, like, let us know, because 
we, we love to have more people who are good at this, because then I personally have to do less work. <laughs> good. good afternoon. Um, I've had two on the blog so far, but they were both about 4,000 word one shots. For a longer story that's going to be updated frequently, how do you advise to pace it early to hook in an audience without giving the entire story away in the first few chapters? <clears throat> there was actually something, we were talking in our room last night about story things because we had like 12 people in there and we were all drunk, so of course we started talking about horse fiction. Um, <laughs> but it was, something, it was something that, Couch, you told me about like when you took a screenwriting class, one of the things they told you was in the first five minutes of a story you can do anything. So what they're really referring to there is you're talking about how you get readers in for the first thing. You need to have something that makes them wonder what the hell's going on and makes them want to keep reading to find out. So there's a, um, one of the lines, and I forget what book it was exactly from, but it's one of the lines that one of my old creative writing teachers just used to praise as one of the best hooks she's ever read. The, the line goes, when I was little, I used to think, sit in my room and think of ways to kill my daddy. So it's a, it gets, grabs your attention from the start, and it makes you, okay, what is going on? Who is this person, and why do they feel that way? And makes you want to keep reading. So, I mean, you don't necessarily have to have, like, the single line to function as your hook, but you do want to have a paragraph or an opening section or just something that functions as something that gets its teeth into the reader and doesn't let go. And I kind of want to embellish on what Aqua just said about there. When, when you have, like, five minutes or just, like, five pages, like, whatever metric you use to define, like, the very beginning of your story, I mean, uh, you can't... You can't do just like anything. Like there's nothing that will turn a reader away from like the rest of your grand epic than just like dumping pages of exposition upon their heads. Like you you really need to use those introductory paragraphs to just like kind of lay down the rules of your story and just like kind of plant the seeds of what a reader can expect in their head like in their heads so that they're more more compelled to like read on after that. Yeah. My rule of thumb is I try to make sure that I always have right at the beginning, a, a conflict, where my little mental checklist for this is, what character do we care about, what do they want, and why can't they have it? And like, that will get you something interesting going on. And, if you, and you do need to have something interesting right up front, or, I will, or you know, readers will just be opening up a, a new tab. And something I've noticed about like pony fiction, like the last two years, is that like it's been getting longer and longer. I mean, um, I still remember when Wingmares came out; it was 63 pages in Google Docs, but that only comes into like 20,000 words. And there are plenty of other stories on fin fiction that regularly go above like 40,000, 50,000. They're still in progress. If we could all just raise our eyes to the ceiling, shake our fist, and mutter "skirts," I would feel really good. <laughs> oh, oh, I was done. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, I guess I wasn't done, but um, also just like, <laughs> yeah. I'm under pressure here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I mean, like, it, it's, it's great if you want to write, like, the next great equestrian novel and all that, but uh, do try, do, like, aim for clarity in your words and, like, being concise whenever possible. You don't have to take it all the way like Ernest Hemingway did and all that, but generally, like, the shorter you're able to, like, make your story, you know, as Shakespeare said, brevity is wit, and all that, like, it'll, it'll actually just like give your readers like more incentive to read a story that they can actually finish within their time. All that. Except if you're Captain Chrysalid, you can write all the, all the words you want after that. <laughs> <laughs> actually, maybe I should, uh, I think I write, I have the longest story of uh, everyone here present. Uh, like, I don't know if you want me to. Oh, oh my god, it's yes. It's explicitly about long ass stories. Go for it. Okay. Come on. All right. Okay, I'll even get out of my seat. It's all about you. All right, I'm gonna personally say, all right, I uh, represent the demographic among pony writers, okay, who can't control themselves and who end up writing hundreds of thousands of words. Hey, we should be friends. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I always found it uh, much harder to write a short fic very well. I mean, a lot of people remember Best Night Ever, which is probably, I think, um, one of my, my best known fanfic. But, that was actually done as a challenge to myself to write something, anything, in just 50,000 words. <laughs> it's hard sometimes. I, I kind of, uh, from the very start of writing fiction in, under a pen name that I will never share, um, but it was in Beast Wars, uh, that I, I always found it a lot easier to parse out the majority of a story over a very long period of time. 
but you're, you're, they're, they're absolutely right when they say they need a hook to get it to get it in. It's just like fishing, all right. You got the you got the bait, all right, but and the animal is attracted to the bait ultimately, and it holds on to the bait. But what gets it is that one little tiny hook that, that pierces the you know the inside of their mouth, or sometimes their gills, or sometimes their eyes. And <laughs> oh. anyway, this took an interesting turn. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> the point is, um, it, you start with a conflict to begin with, or you start with a character to begin with, but you have to, in that um, first 5,000 words, do what you would do with a fic and establish sort of like a mini story. And this is probably not the best example, but you know how a, a lot of times um, things like um, animated cartoons, uh, South Park or The Simpsons or whatever, they'll start off with a tiny story in the beginning which will then lead into the main story. And that also works uh, in fiction for a bit. You know, the worst thing that I can usually see in a large, in a large story is, again, the exposition dump. All right, exposition is something, all right, you don't need to bombard your readers with it, all right? Dole it out in little spoonfuls over however many months. And if it's good exposition, then they'll keep eating up those little spoonfuls for however long you have. And if it's bad exposition, then they'll stop and you'll know. But yeah, you don't give them the whole meal, you give them little bits, like a trail of candies. So that the person's like, oh, a piece of candy. Piece of candy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also just story. be careful where you're starting your story. Like a lot of, a fair number of stories just start too soon, like before the interesting things are happening. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever like said to somebody like this, it gets good in chapter four. Kill your first three chapters. <laughs> Just start, start with the start. Yeah, start with the good stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's why people give the advice to start in medias res because that's what you're doing is you're starting it literally in the middle of things, and that is one of the most intriguing ways to start a story is it's an immediate throwing the reader into a situation they're not familiar with and making them want to know how it got started. Also, a good place to introduce your antagonist or protagonist yeah. from the start and see if people like them. And if they don't like them, then you quickly swap. <laughs> so we've got a few more minutes. So what yeah, do you think? Like one, five, five minutes. Yeah. So yeah. one, maybe two questions. Yeah, one short question probably. Well, that's good. I actually have a really short one. Um, what do you guys have any kind of um, resubmission policies when it comes to fan fictions that have already become established on Equestria Daily, but? Uh, I'll just use my own as an example. There's a one I submitted a long time ago that a lot of people want me to revise because they don't like the ending. It's about three chapters long. If I wanted to do the revision, would I have to go through a resubmission process or could I just throw it at you guys and say, throw these up? So this depends on whether you're like making some changes, in which case you can just make the changes. Or if you're like totally rewriting your story from the ground up, then we treat it as basically a new story. And like I would just submit it and put in the notes, a previous version was done here, throw the link, but this is totally new. I think it, I it would be a rewrite story. of the last three chapters. They would literally be thrown it's out and I'd be writing three new story. ones. Yeah, yeah. In, the oh, in the specific case, you might wanna like write in and just say, this is what I'm thinking of doing, how should I do it? Yeah, Seth might see fit to just post the, the uh, chapters as like an alternate ending as a story update on your story. I thought it was just a name change. Well, I suppose they changed quite a bit, but it didn't really affect us. So we just <laughs> How are we for time? We got two okay. minutes. One, one more. Yep. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, so you have some content rules, like for example, no um, sexual content. So does the quality of the story affect how far it can push those content rules? Because for example, Fallout Equestria and the spin-off <coughs> Pride Chapter Rises. Chapter 20 and a half, am I right? Oh, well, just product yeah. license in okay. general. It, it's not even sexual in you, and though. It's straight up sex. They're extremely violent, they're gory, and they're very graphic. So just the fact that they're very well written, they have editing teams that help them such as that, Here's like, the th allow them to be more explicit. Here's the thing about Fall Equestria. That was first published during a time where we had like no content standards. <laughs> 
So that is a relic from a time where, as I believe I kind of mentioned before, our standards were, does it have horses in it and can we read it? So <laughs> at that point we didn't know the extent to which it was going to do that. Um, but in direct answer to your question about does the quality of the writer or the quality of the writing change that, I think it's more like the, the skill of the author can change it because a skillful author can imply a lot of things that are happening without necessarily resorting to excessive gore or like explicit sexual content. Or even just like showing the sexual content in the yeah. first place. And, all that. I, I, and we're capable of judging whether something has sexual content and that's the point of its existence. Like when we think about, you know, what we would refer to as a clot pick or everything on fanfiction.net. <laughs> um, Ooh. When we're talking about something like that, the point of that story's existence is, this, to be fair, is the sexual content. When you have sexual content in a story where it is a component of the story rather than the central component of it, then it's a different story and then we can judge it if a little bit more objectively on whether we're okay with it. The, yeah. the thing we want to avoid is we don't want to post anything that's straight porn and we don't want to post anything that's like cupcakes where we're just tearing ponies in half for the hell of it. But you posted cupcakes. Cupcakes is now gone. We we finally got Seth to remove it from the blog. After Only like a year and a half of telling him to do it. <laughs> but I mean like... Um, there are there are a lot of reasons why we have like these like like these no sex no gore guidelines in place. But like one of the one of the foremost is that like people from Hasbro actually do read Equestria Daily as well. And we're already enough on the fence just like posting saucy ponies in the draw friend and like <laughs> sending up shipping fan fiction and all that. That like we don't want to get hit with a CND just because like something like just because Hasbro didn't like the way like one author portrayed their IP. Yeah. There, there is a non-zero in, number of times that Seth has posted porn in a draw friend, though. <laughs> it's kind of funny every time yeah, it happens. Seth is less consistent than we are, and I think it was still... Like, Fallout was still when Seth was... Like, had a lot of personal yeah. involvement in the fic process, if I recall correctly. So that is probably how that ended up there, although something like that would not get approved now. The, the email for FOE being accepted was literally like, well, I hope I didn't make a mistake with these two epic fics, like, scheduled. <laughs> The like actual just chapter based, with the sex. Based events. on what I've heard, it does later on in the story. No, I don't it, think it gets so. And that's, that's purely gory. because I have not read the entire thing. I got like twenty chapters in. I just. That's true, we did. Or does PWP's plot what plot, which doesn't apply to obviously pony <laughs> There are at least like 30% of pony fix that actually have plots. So, yeah, so what we were saying earlier about how we will often like get into big debates about like there will be second opinions, fourth opinions, twelfth opinions, this is what we're talking about. So, I guess that's what would happen if Fallout were submitted today. Speaking of this thing, I know that. You've said that before that you don't grandfather things in, like you don't go back and check the stories that wouldn't make the cut now. You don't go back and cut them. But I know, like, there's one story a friend told me, uh, the Death Note Equestria, or whatever it's called. As I understand it, is pretty much a carbon copy of the anime Death Note, just with pony names and the characters, to where it's like almost an exact ripoff. Like, something like that. How close. Because I, I know when I submitted my story, it was only the prologue that was read, and the guy said, stop, no, this needs work, and so I had to go back and do it again until it got approved. Something like that, how far in do you read? Because something like that might not be apparent by the first chapter or two. We, well, and and, we and no a, one's faulting you, I'm just curious. We have a retroactive policy with stuff like that, like where we'll post, we have done things where we posted things, and then I think there was one particularly memorable instance where we actually took a story back off the blog for something like that exact reason. Um, we refer to it colloquially as Hitler Jack, and the reason for that is because the story started out innocent enough, and at some point later on, like a few chapters later that we hadn't read to, we discovered that for whatever reason the author had seen fit to make Applejack the head of a concentration camp. <laughs> so clearly, we didn't want that staying up, but like that's what I'm talking about. We do have a retroactive policy with stuff like that, so I mean... When you're talking about it's still up there, why is it still up there? The best answer is we just weren't really aware of that. Yeah. So I mean, like, as long as we can go check it out, we can go look it up. Um, if it's a, if it's content issue that um, 
that is something that we don't want on the blog at all, then we might take it down. With your case, it sounds more like it doesn't adhere to our current standards for being posted, which at this point, I'm not sure how much would happen there. It, at that point, it's more just live and let live. It got up. It wasn't necessarily fair by our content standards now, but the standards have evolved over time. So, I mean, thanks for bringing it up, but I'm not sure if we would go back and like retroactively remove that. Okay. So we are out of time, so I think that's going to be it for everyone yeah. staring at us. Uh, <laughs> many of us are going to be a few rooms down in quills and sofas, so if you want to yeah, hang out there. You can there. come talk to us. <laughs> Autographs are free. <laughs> uh, they have oh, Thanks for coming. They don't have quills either. Thank you for coming, everyone. We really appreciate you seeing out here. Uh, yeah, that. ...by the pre-readers. And we don't, uh, oh, here they come. Oh, look who it is. <laughs> you guys get to share the mic. Couch and aqua. Fashionably <laughs> late, as usual. We're just, like, hobnobbing with the VAs upstairs. No big. <laughs> yeah, so... Very good. This is uh, Couch Crusader and Aquaman, part of our... Howdy. We're slightly buzzed. <laughs> And <laughs> so if the, most stories do make it past that initial screening for blatant, blatant problems, at which point they get forwarded to the, the big pre-reader mailing list. Uh, so it goes in a spreadsheet with all of the basic information. Uh, and then we come through it as we see ones that we feel like uh, reading. We will pick a story and start reading it. and. We get to select the ones we want so that if there is a guy who just hates all like shipping stories, then he can just not read shipping stories, which I think works out pretty well. Uh, and it's, so we, we choose which ones we're taking on. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why it's useful, another reason that there's a bunch of us, because we all have different tastes, so we all really can read things that we at least hope we're gonna like. Uh, so we don't have to, you know, have that additional bias already stacked before we get, get into any reviewing. I believe that we have something on like 29 or 30 different pre-readers right now. So like chances are that you're going to get someone who's going to look at your story in the most favorable light possible. Like, well, and the thing I want to add to that is that when we say like one person's looking at it, that doesn't mean that one person exclusively is looking at it. We have a lot of situations where we'll have kind of a group discussion over a particular story, mm -hmm. especially Second if it's opinions. something that's difficult to figure out or kind of like dips into a couple different genres. So it's not out of the question that like we'll have you know our own little you know come to Jesus meeting about it or come to Celestia as the case may be. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to emphasize that, like what they're saying is all that. Um, we just try to get the right people reading the right stories. Yep. Yep. And at that point, we read it and make the uh, and we uh, make the decision about whether it meets the standards that we're trying to have for Equestria Daily. And if it is, then hooray. And if it isn't, then we will. Uh, the rejections vary in length. Uh, some are just a real quick, like a paragraph of these are the issues that I noticed. And some, some of us like to go very, very in depth line by line. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, so like our response, so we will give you some kind of idea. It is general, like it is the responsibility for fixing it up is generally on the author to find uh, if they need more detail than is provided to either ask us for clarification, which happens a lot and like is totally fine, mm -hmm. or to go to uh, another source of, there's a lot of really good communities that will help authors who are having trouble figuring out their name on fin fiction. Uh, just because, you know, we don't really want people coming specifically to us to ask additional questions. If you have additional questions, you can just send them to uh, the Equestria Daily fan fiction address, and we answer them through that. So we try to keep a degree of anonymity in our actual reviews. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. and, and well, it, it depends on the person. I mean, me personally, I just sign it with Pre-Rear Alex. Other people will do their full names. Other people have like five or six that they sign with. That's kind of ridiculous. But yeah, it depends on the person. So to go into the general 
process for how it works. Uh, we only go, we, we look at only stories that people submit to us. We do not comb through looking for things to put in the way some of the other aggregators do. Uh, so only, if the author submits, that is how the process starts. And then we have like a real quick, someone will take a very fast look at it to comb for just real obvious, yeah, just like yeah. horrible, horrible, unreadable grammar or subject matter that is way mm -hmm. over the line. Like if, if you could, like if someone who can, if you can know in two minutes that it's definitely, definitely not going up, we have that, that's the first pass basically. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we will send a, basically a form letter rejection out, uh, letting the person know that certain aspects of the story definitely need work before we even submit it for careful revision. Our other two people are on the way. Uh, but I think they were over at the voice actor panel, but they'll be here shortly. We'll, we'll fill them in. They already, it's counting up. they know the spiel, so it's, it's I think we're up. just going to go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, Welcome, we are Equestria Daily pre-readers. Uh, I am Ben Mann. I'm Pegasus Rescue Brigade. And I'm Alex Straza. Uh, so we are responsible for uh, the fan fiction that gets posted on Equestria Daily. Uh, so what we're, we're going to be going over a quick rundown of how the process works, and then most of this is going to be opening it up to questions uh, about the, the details of what we do, how we make our decisions about fan fiction in general, because all of us are writers as well as pre-readers. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that some of us are not terrible. Uh, <laughs> Which one? Uh, oh. It is not me. I mean, I don't are dislike we, Sky Pirates. Are we, are we allowed to say who that is or not? Yeah, I, I think we should respect the pseudonymity, I, whatever the word is. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, yeah that, he does, there is a guy who uses that pseudonym, and I should probably mm -hmm. not tell you the other names he goes by, because yeah, he'd when, be using them if he wanted people to know. Typically, when we write a response that we send out to an author who has uh, submitted their story, we sign it with something different than our actual author. If you're talking about like dialogue punctuation, what is up with that, or like pacing, how do I figure out what's going on there? Uh, and some of us also like to give a lot of that information on our own time just as they're doing that, which may or may not be changing, but. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so we have, generally speaking, we have a three strike rule. You, so you can fix it and resubmit it, and a lot of really good stories get sent back the first time and then come back even stronger the second or the third time and go up then. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's a useful process for taking some things that are good and making them better. And this is something that's probably going to get me in trouble with like all the other pre-readers when I say this, but um, the three strikes rule is like by no means something like hard and fast that we adhere to 100% of the time. It was, the rule was originally implemented in order to prevent people from just receiving their rejection notice and then just like sending it back an hour later with like minimal fixes on the issues that we told them about and all that. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the times if it's, been, if it's clear that like on the third strike an author has still put in a lot of effort into improving their writing, then we'll more often than not give them like enough, more chances to just like kind of get onto the blog. And we also like have, um, like the levels of rejection like vary, like if we give you a strike it's a moon, but if it's something that we can just like send back for like minor grammar fixes, like a missing word there, then we just send it to Mars instead. <laughs> Which means that when it comes I, back we're not going to look over it very carefully, we're just going to be like, yeah, like you, you did that thing we said.